Hi there, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon. And it's so great to see so many faces here. And thanks so much for joining us. My name is Amy Smith. I'm the senior TE for Save the Children from Save the Children Columbia. And today, basically, we're going to take you through um, a section around um, the global protection and also looking at how we're negotiating uh, in communities. A huge thanks to the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action, the Global Child Protection Team and GBV Areas of Responsibility and Save the Children for making this event possible. A special and warm welcome to our representatives from the Swiss Development Corporation, the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency, who will be saying a few words later in this session. This year, as I'm sure all of you know, the special focus of the Global Protection Forum is a thematic segment that is on access that protects. As many of you also know, most protection cluster operations estimate that protection services can reach and be reached on average by 25 to 50% of uh, populations affected. But we also know that children and youth make up the majority of these populations that are affected by humanitarian crises. They often play a huge and vital role in understanding access and protection needs. And so it's really important that we engage with these populations to help facilitate their access and ensure their access is to the targeted, specialised and affected services that are designed to protect them. The first part of our panel is comprised of practitioners and young people who are going to present some reflections from research relating to access. This includes frontline experience from Mali, from Colombia, from South Sudan. The second part of our event will be held in two breakout groups to further explore findings and reflections from the projects presented in these panel discussions. And then finally, uh, the findings and recommendations from these discussions will be included in a summary note uh, that will be part of the overall Global Protection Forum events summary. So that's a bit of the overview. I'd now like to pass to my co-facilitator, Davina, to introduce herself. So over to you, Davina. Okay, so um, before starting, I would first of all like to say um, there are sometimes my camera will be on and off because my bandwidth is really unstable. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session and uh, to my presentation. First of all, um, permit me to thank the Almighty God and you all for coming here today. It is an honor to have the, the opportunity to address such a distinguished audience. So I'm gonna, the team is gonna share my screen for the, for the PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Um, Hi, so I am Divina Malum, your, your second co-moderator for this session. I am the founder of Children for Peace. I am a peace building practitioner, cartoonist, humanitarian, nuclear non-proliferation activist, an international speaker, and a student in AI and big data. A university student in AI and big data. So you can go to the next slide. Okay, so here I'm gonna do a presentation of Children for Peace. So before um, presenting Children for Peace, I'm gonna give um, a little context of um, the political context in Africa. So basically it is characterized by an escalation of violence and insecurity perpetrated by terrorist groups like Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab and the various affiliations of Al-Qaeda, which are relatively well known both regionally and globally. And Cameroon, my country is in the grip of multiple conflicts in the East, in the North, and also the Anglophone crisis specifically in the North. So you can go to the to the next slide. Okay, basically, Children for Peace is a girl-led movement created in 2015 after the first attack by Boko Haram, and we are working across Cameroon and other countries in Africa for children's rights, gender equity, peace building, and to increase the number of children's participation in public policies. So basically, before talking about our project, the various projects we had, we mobilized children in uh, complex cultural backgrounds and affected areas by war to define and implement action plans and several local and nationwide activities, among which we have uh, awareness raising campaigns, realization of documentaries on peace building, children workshops, and uh, peace cartoons. Okay, so as I said, we have um, some projects. Basically, we'll start with Silence the Gun. So Silence the Gun basically is um, an integrated citizen engagement project led by girls aiming to realize a conflict-free Africa by engaging children and girls to mobilize all stakeholders to prioritize efforts on peace, children and girls' rights and effective socioeconomic development. So the project aims to democratize and reshape local governance and conflict management, thereby unleashing grassroots approaches. Okay, here we can see that uh, we have been engaging with children 
where we organize some sensitization campaigns. And each child is engaging to say uh, they are standing up to, to silence the guns. Okay, so the DDR tech, this is um, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration technology for, for XI soldiers. So basically, Children for Peace has been working closely with the African Nation of Young Leaders for Peace and Sustainable Development to develop an application called the DDR tech, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration technology for XI soldiers. So basically, the project aims. Um, to fight against the enrollment of children in armed groups by providing them with viable socioeconomic reintegration opportunities in civilian life. So basically the project is, uh, is um, still under development. Okay, so I'm gonna conclude with this, with the African Parliament for Girls. So the African Parliament for, for Girls is um, an official forum for girls to look at the local and global problems and come up with their own solutions. So the aim of the project is to inform youths about political processes and get them involved in their schools and communities. So basically it would help them to like, it will help empower children and specifically girls. So thank you all um, for your kind attention. Okay, so um, before passing to the, to the panel discussion, we are gonna do a quick poll to get a sense of how much people know about um, this topic. If you're so excited as I am, I invite each and every one of you to click the link in the chat and answer the questions. So you can go on. I get a sense that that is the final poll. I don't see the numbers changing. Uh, so it seems here that most people are somewhat confident in terms of community negotiations for access, but for many people, this is still a new, new area for them. We're now gonna pass to the following question on the Menti poll, if that's all right. How confident are you with children's participation for projects related to access? How confident are you with children's participation for projects related to access? Okay, so the results are coming in. Thanks so much, everyone, for taking part. It seems to the majority, this is actually a very new area for people in terms of child participation for projects related to access. There are some who are somewhat confident and 21 who are very confident. So great to have you on board. Okay, I think that's, that's uh, the final numbers here. So thanks so again for taking part. So again, like I say, it seems that the majority, this is still a really new area for you. Uh, and that's great to have you here. And hopefully in this space today, we can learn a bit more around child participation in these processes. Right, well, we'll move on to the next part of our talk. And so here, uh, the idea is basically, we're gonna have a panel discussion. Um, I'd like to introduce two of my colleagues from Save the Children uh, for this part where we're going to explain in a bit more detail community negotiation. So we have with us Roberta Gadler. She is the Child Protection Technical Advisor from the Mali Country Office for Save the Children. A warm welcome to Roberta. And we have Fernanda Almeida. She is a research assistant for the Civil Military uh, uh, Unit from Save the Children International. A great welcome to you as well, Fernanda. We're basically going to start up with a um, discussion with Roberta and with Fernanda. Uh, but just for context, I'm going to start off with a quick introduction around the situation in Mali, just for those who maybe are not so associated with the situation. So since 2012, Mali has been facing an unprecedented and complex crisis where insecurity is adding to weak governance, high hunger rates, climate change and pre-existing vulnerabilities. And despite the peace and reconciliation agreement in 2015, insecurity is still growing in the north and the centre of the country and is now spreading to the southern parts of the country. Inter-community clashes have intensified in the area of the mali burkina faso niger borders. And the complexity of this context is due to the multi-level conflict, including different kinds of armed actors and groups, including radicals, self-defense groups, um, militias, organized community groups, state and international armed forces, various agendas and interests, and adding to this ethnic and historical composite relationships, including ties, rivalries among different groups. Save the Children in Mali has been engaging since 2019 with humanitarian agencies, communities, and non-state armed actors um, to facilitate better humanitarian access and promote protection of children through the respect of international humanitarian law and human rights law. 
Before I pass to Fernanda, I'm just going to give a little bit of context to the work that we ourselves here in Colombia did with the team with Fernanda. Uh, so we were part of a study with Fernanda's team around community negotiation access to basic services that was done both in uh, Colombia and also in South Sudan. So in the Colombia context, uh, unfortunately, despite the peace accords in 2016, here in Colombia, we still see the impact of armed conflict to this day. I think it's important to say that we're not seeing one armed conflict, but multiple narratives of armed conflict that tend to affect some of the most marginalized and vulnerable communities here in Colombia. For the purpose of this study, we were focusing on the departments of Bali de Cauca, Cauca and Aniño, which are part of the coastal Pacific here in Colombia. And then we went to the border regions, including Arauca, where we were able to understand a bit of the dynamic that you see on the Venezuela-Colombia border, which has a double affectation, not just of armed conflict, but also of the Venezuela migration refugee crisis. So that's a little bit of context on my end. I'd now like to pass over to Fernanda, who can provide a little bit more background around the results of this study that we did in December of last year. So over to you, Fernanda. Nice. Thanks for introducing the research, Amy. Thanks to having you all here. So uh, I will just give a brief <laughs> introduction again, and then I will go directly to the main findings. But this research was a joint effort with uh, the Norwegian Refugee Council, and we aim to provide evidence and to better understand the choices that communities make and the techniques they employ to negotiate with armed actors for improvements in their access and protection. And we try to determine what added value if any, humanitarian actors, actors may offer to community land negotiations, taking the case of Colombia and South Sudan. And we, after literature review and extensive research, a pre-desk research, we found that we would like to go to Colombia and South Sudan because of previous connections with the country offices as well and the, the situation of time conflict and access there. Uh, so, in the study, we used a mixed method approach uh, with literature review, semi structured interviews, focus group discussions, and surveys. So, we had uh, three uh, main indicators for this uh, research it was protection threats, community social fabric, and community leverage. And in Colombia, as Demi mentioned, we visited four departments, and in South Sudan, we visited six different states. Uh, and we had, uh, in the end, 141 research tools. Um, I think we have a, a slide where we can just display um, the map of the locations where we visited and the total of tools. Yes, so um, in the part of the, the page, you can see uh, South Sudan, and in, in, in the top, you can see Colombia. And then regarding the results, uh, we found, um, I will give you really quick, but you can, uh, after I, we can share more results. But uh, we found high levels of perceived deprivation and unsafety in both places, but it varied based on personal experiences and the country. In Colombia, everyone reported lack of access, uh, most commonly healthcare, education, and job opportunities, access to wash services, electricity, and internet, Roads and other basic infrastructure was also highlighted, not least to guarantee food security. And the lack of access is often caused by lack of land rights and restriction in freedom of movement due to fear of violence. And most common threats were child and youth recruitment and extortion. And the presence of mines, kidnapping, kidnappings, disappearance and violence, killings and sexual violence were also occasionally mentioned. In South Sudan, 81% uh, of responder, respondents reported lack of access to resources, goods, and services because it was not safe. Education, food, and healthcare were the most commonly mentioned resource, good, or services that they struggled to access. And the lack of access was mentioned as often caused by restricted freedom of movement due to threats of violence. And the common threats were killing, theft, cattle raiding, rape, and child abduction. And a curiosity of this, um, the perceived um, violence in the communities is that men reported feeling less safe than women. And uh, sometimes we don't expect that. We also found that social, social cohesion depends on the location and the demographics, where in general, there was higher social cohesion in Colombia than in South Sudan. Uh, in both countries, younger participants were more willing to work collectively with their community and community leaders had greater trust 
for other community members. However, in South Sudan, participants were less likely to know the armed groups than, in, than those in Colombia. Uh, I 30 seconds. <laughs> I will, I think, uh, talk short for the, the second one. But then also the capacity of the community varied a lot. And in both places, they, ha they had community committees. In Colombia, Juntas de Acción Comunal. Uh, in South Sudan, religious leaders were really important to negotiate. And when we asked about um, uh, the presence of humanitarians there, most of them uh, wanted humanitarians to be there to have a presence in, in, and to follow up with the negotiations. But the communities itself and the community members, they already knew the armed groups in, Colo in South Sudan less than in Colombia, but they kn knew how to uh, negotiate with them for their access. Uh, even though it was um, the lack of access was great, they, the, the capacity of negotiation was also good. So yes, I would just give the floor to Amy again. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Thanks so much, uh, Fernanda. So I'm conscious of time, but I know that it would be great for us if we could speak uh, to Roberta, thinking about this context that we have in Mali. Uh, so, bueno, again, Roberta, a very warm welcome to you, and thanks so much for taking part. Roberta, one of the questions I wanted to ask is how we save the children supporting communities and children in negotiations for protection in the context of Mali? Thank you, Amy, and uh, I hope you heard me well. Uh, so uh, thank you, everybody, to, to be here. So as uh, you introduced a little bit already, the, the, the context and the work that Save the Children is doing in, uh, in the last uh, years with communities on one side and uh, armed and state territories uh, on the other side. So one of the initiatives that, uh, we, <clears throat> that we had that Save the Children had is the Stop uh, the War Against uh, children campaign that gave us the opportunity to engage directly with the community leaders and religious, religious uh, leaders um, and train them and so that they develop their own uh, action plans to promote the social cohesion and uh, child uh, protection, of course, and access for uh, children to basic services uh, like education. So one example of, um, of a result uh, uh, of, this, uh, of this work is that the community and religious leaders, they took the, the initiative to, um, to dialogue and negotiate with some uh, uh, what we call the extremist armed groups uh, to, um, to reopen, to allow to reopen some schools uh, who were uh, closed due to insecurity in, um, in the center of Mali, so in Jenea and Badiagara villages. Uh, in parallel, we, we have been working uh, with, uh, with children directly, involving them uh, in an initiative called the Children and Youth uh, Ambassadors for Peace. So Save the Children uh, supported uh, child, uh, children and youth-led uh, organization. Uh, on um, on the school uh, safe school declaration to develop advocacy strategy uh, and uh, address messages uh, to of the conflict stakeholders, including the government, uh, uh, like the Ministry uh, of Defense and Security, the Prime Minister, and also some uh, of the unknown state uh, actors and uh, self defense groups. So children were really at the center of the awareness raising uh, activities. Uh, on the grave violations and uh, on the safe school uh, declaration that was um, endorsed by, by Mali in uh, 2018. And um, as a result, so they, uh, they had this engagement uh, from uh, the, some of these uh, uh, armed no state uh, actors to commit uh, to never occupy schools, uh, to authorize uh, humanitarian uh, actors to um, uh, implement uh, conflict sensitive uh, education uh, programs uh, uh, such as uh, uh, school monitoring uh, committees uh, uh, without their presence or so letting them uh, work on it uh, without fear of, uh, of real threat and retaliation. Thank you for uh, the slide. Um, uh, and um, so, and to um, the Armed and State Actors committed also to, to train their own troop uh, on the guidelines uh, for promoting school uh, um, from, um, free, from uh, military use during, uh, during the conflict. Um, and finally, as we were saying, uh, Save the Children supports uh, the community negotiation also involving directly and discussing negotiating directly with some of the unknown state actors 
particularly uh, the, the groups uh, who are signatory of the peace agreement, Algebra peace agreement of 2015, and some of the self-defense uh, uh, groups uh, that are active in the, in the center of Mali. Um, so we train them and um, we engage them in uh, some workshop that they, they develop action plans and engagement on uh, the international humanitarian law, the human rights uh, respect, uh, the respect of Paris principles, uh, um, and a sixth grade, uh, on, on the sixth grade violation against uh, uh, children in Kofi, of course. Um, so they, they pledged to release uh, um, associated children to, um, to increase the humanitarian access uh, and to stop occupation uh, of schools uh, and, uh, and kidnap uh, and recruitment of, of children. So that's a brief overview. Thank you. No, thank you so much, Roberta. I think it's really interesting and it's so great to hear of, a, of an actual implementation based experience that you've had in Mali. Recognizing that you've covered a huge number of stakeholders in this work, uh, my following question really is, I imagine working with such a range of stakeholders, there's gonna be some challenges and potential opportunities now. So my question is, what are the main challenges and opportunities to continue to support communities in negotiating for their own protection in this Malian context? Yes, of course, uh, there are uh, a lot of challenges, I would say, and the main are related uh, to, the, to the actual situation, the political and the security situation. As you said, the conflict is spreading from the north and the center of the country to the south and the west. And that means that there is a restriction, restriction of the humanitarian access due to insecurity and uh, possible attacks, uh, even uh, targeting humanitarian uh, staff. And the nature of the conflict itself makes it make, make this uh, uh, challenging to, to work with the different uh, um, actors. Uh, of course, there is a, uh, an overlap of the armed conflict to intercommunity tensions that are um, uh, often also used and instrumentalized by some groups uh, to, to promote their own agendas. And so it, it goes, uh, it contrasts uh, really the efforts. Uh, uh, to, to promote social cohesion. And um, so the engaging uh, communities uh, on negotiation can also have adverse uh, effect uh, and there is a, a need to, to be really careful to, to not put them in, in further uh, risk. So for example, there are some, um, some situation that we faced where uh, we couldn't uh, involve uh, uh, communities uh, as a central and focal point in uh, reporting on grave violations uh, of children's rights uh, or other sensitive uh, activities uh, because it would uh, expose them uh, uh, to, to further risk. Um, so we have also uh, faced uh, a limited capacity to, to follow up uh, on the action plans that the armed um, state actors uh, uh, sign because of course these are uh, um, not compulsory and uh, so the, their implementation and uh, to get evidence of the impact is, uh, is not so, so easy uh, for, uh, for us. We, we need uh, to, to really um, keep this balance between the, our neutrality as a humanitarian actor and the capacity to, to denounce uh, violations and to follow up on this uh, engagement. Um, so in terms of opportunities, uh, we would see uh, for sure that uh, the systematic conflict analysis that uh, we are we are doing uh, with the communities allows us to to have a better understanding of uh, of the conflict dynamics and to adapt uh, our strategies uh, according to the situation that is of course evolving and um, and to find so the, the better way to negotiate and to access to have uh, um, acceptance uh, and uh, access to to people of course and to, and to children. Um, so the, for sure, the central role of, um, of the community and religious leaders uh, in, uh, in promoting also the social cohesion and the um, child protection, access of children to, to services is, uh, is something uh, uh, that we would like to, uh, to consider an opportunity and uh, of course to, to strengthen. And uh, finally, I would um, just uh, just say that uh, the um, the child participation in the in the peace process is something really um, uh, promising practices. And um, so we are uh, right now 
working with the child parliament of Mali, um, involving them, they are leading actually um, an initiative to build a, a policy guidance tool to support the meaningful participation of children in, uh, in the peace process uh, in Mali. So that's uh, really promising and um, I hope we will have uh, the chance to, to tell you more uh, in the future on that. Thank you very much. No, thanks so much, Roberta. I think that's so interesting. And I wholeheartedly agree with what you said about child and youth led participation in peace processes. Here in Colombia, I think we've seen the real power that young people can have in those peace processes and the importance of their presence. I just want to finish off with Fernanda before we pass over to Davina. Uh, Fernanda, listening to these examples that we have from Roberta and Marlino, I think it's really a, a visual representation of the study in practice, you know, and a bit more, I imagine, of some of the findings you mentioned uh, earlier. So my question is, from the findings of that study, Fernanda, and, and listening to what Roberta has said in Mali, how do you think we can adapt our ways of working to participate and really support communities in some of these negotiations? Nice, thanks. Uh, I think all that we found in Colombia and South Sudan is really related to what Roberta just mentioned. Uh, maybe she, she, she can present also some lessons learned from Mali where we can implement in Colombia and South Sudan and hopefully in other places. But we got uh, this, the feeling and, and the evidence and the data uh, from this research saying that uh, people are lacking access. Uh, they have knowledge on how to negotiate. Of course, there are some protection issues and risks. And there's also a lot of contextual analysis needed. Uh, and as we've seen in the beginning of this event, humanitarian access is not an end goal, but it needs to fulfill a broader goal of making people safe. So with this, we, we, we just try to gather all the information to try to um, promote and support communities that already know how to negotiate uh, to be better achieve the the constraints that they are struggling with. So we try to we draft. It is a work in progress. But for for us, we 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 are aiming to to provide a tool where community members and uh, country level staff can together think on ways of how to negotiate with armed actors. Um, being then local authorities or non-state armed groups, uh, knowing that the communities, they already have uh, a lot of knowledge. So the idea that we, we found uh, needed is to provide a systematized way of doing so, because the knowledge, it's already there. And the idea is to prepare for negotiation dialogues. Uh, we based this uh, tool that we draft uh, from the tools from the CCHN Manual for Negotiators, uh, so we were inspired by them and we try to think on, on ways on how we can uh, provide community center baselines and ensure adequate and appropriate programming, how we could strengthen and give visibility to women, youth and religious leaders. And youth appeared as the most, the, the, one of the most important groups in achieving this, these uh, goals related to access and protection. So the idea is to try to, to implement this tool uh, in some sense in the local area in field and try to see if this is supporting or not uh, the negotiations dialogue. Um, so we will have uh, a space to better debate and discuss this in the breakout room. Um, and if you stay in the breakout room one, we will try to test using a scenario. But yes, we, we, we found a lot of knowledge uh, from local communities and, and especially youth and women and, and local leaders. And so, so we just want to facilitate. We don't want a, a top-down approach, but yes, I think uh, this is the, was the main goal from, from the finding. Thanks so much, Fernanda. And before we close, uh, Fernanda, Roberta, I don't know if there's any closing remarks that you have thinking about this study, the learnings and lessons that we've heard from Roberta and Mali before we pass on to Davina. Maybe just, uh, just in, on what Fernanda said, that of course uh, the contexts are very different uh, and the situation is, uh, is different from one country to another and even from one part of in one, inside one country and another. Uh, but I think that it's very useful to do this uh, kind of uh, uh, learning and exchange of lesson learned from one place to another. And uh, 
uh, as we will see in the in the breakout room with these tools uh, they can be adapted and the base uh, of the um, of the of this kind of research uh, could really be useful in different uh, contexts and situation thank you yes i agree with roberta <laughs> Perfect. Well, thanks so much, Roberta and Fernanda. And I look forward to that breakout room where we can explore in more detail, as Roberta says, some of those contextual uh, differences and understanding the exchange that we can have between different countries to facilitate these processes. So right now, I'd like to pass over to my co-facilitator, Davina, who I understand is going to introduce a segment of participation from the Philippines. So over to you, Fernanda. Eh, Davina, sorry. Uh -huh. Thank you for giving me the floor, um, Ami. So actually, I am enjoyed because it is um, a pleasure for me to introduce two amazing young people, Carl Baguk and Kate Bitton, who are both adolescent representatives from the Chai and Adolescent Survivor Initiative core groups and uh, Community and Family Services International, the CFSI, based in the Philippines, and are here to talk a bit about their experiences. But here I call for the attention of each and every one of you, because before we begin with the questions, we want to show you an interesting six-minute videos of the project in the Philippines. So pay great attention to that. There are a lot of uh, sexual abuse cases uh, among children, and particularly if you look at the age range, it's, it's more of 13 years old until 15. So given the situation of the yung mga experiences ng adolescent in terms of child protection and gender-based violence, uh, ang CFSI together with UNICEF, ini-implement natin ngayon yung participatory barrier analysis. This project is a youth-led initiative that are being implemented by eight core group members in Sambuanga City. Ang barriers analysis o BAP ay isang youth-led participatory action analysis na proyekto kung saan kami mismong mga kabataan o adolescents at youth ang mismong nagsagawa ng pagkonsulta, pag-identify ng mga barriers to accessing services at nag-design ng mga change activities na amin ring ini-implement sa kasalukuyan. Sa phase 1 ng Barrier Analysis Project, nagsagawa ng pag-uusap or konsultasyon sa mga agencies na tumutugon o lumerespande sa mga kaso ng sexual violence at iba pang klase ng pag-aabuso sa mga kabataan upang malaman kung ano ang mga barriers o balaki sa pag-access ng servisyo ng mga laga para sa biktima ng pang-aabuso. Nagkaroon ng pag-uusap ang mga kabataan tulad namin kung saan tinanong kung bakit nga ba hindi nakaka-access ng servisyo ang mga kabataan. The result were encoded and analysis by us, the adolescent school group who came up with four thematics barriers, number one, access to information, number two, family support and service issues, and number three, referral mechanizing structural process, and number four, child-sensitive case management. We also have identified three change activities or mga activities na maaring gawin ng mga kabataang tulad namin upang matugunan ang mga pangangailangan ng mga kabat iba pang mga kabataan sa mga paaralan, barangays at iba pang mga komunidad na may maraming kabataan. So the first one is the use of social media to increase information dissemination and address social issues. The second one is to conduct advocacy raising activities to further improve family support and address prevalent social issues. The third one is refresher courses and trainings for stakeholders and services providers and a formation of multidisciplinary case conference to address issues on referral mechanisms and structural support al along with child sensitive case management. I learned that we should give young people the opportunity 
to speak and listen to and stand for their rights and be together in this cause. Helping and sharing knows no age or gender. If you will ask me about uh, youth participation, especially involvement or engaging them in terms of the cases of sexual abuse, I think it would be best and it's part of the fundamental rights that they should always be involved and engaged when you talk about youth development. They should always be part of the conversation because they knew better what is best for them. Sexual abuse and exploitation destroy lives, it destroys relationships, and even affect the future of the victims. In the city of Zamboanga, I get a report daily from the Philippine National Police and whenever I get reports of violations against women and children, I immediately refer them to the Social Services Department so that additional counseling can be given. My vision for Zamboanga City is to be a safe space uh, for all children and as a multicultural city, I envision a nuanced and inclusive approach to child protection that takes into consideration the cultural issues and the multi-lens perspective. We, the Women and Children Protection Center, Mindanao Field Unit, would like to extend our support to the project of Community and Family Services International. And we strongly encourage other stakeholders to take action towards this cause. Bilang isang kabataan o adolescents, kailangan po natin mag-participate at maging aktibo sa mga aktibidad upang makatulong sa pag-unlad ng ating kaalaman at kasanayan. When we invest in children, we invest in their future. This is our commitment to making our children's future a reality today. Every child has a right to a safe environment. Be an advocate. Support young people of Zamboanga City in building a community where no child is harmed or abuse. No one, no one, no one, no one, no one, no one, no one left behind. Wow, I, I, I don't know for you, but uh, I was particularly moved away by, by the video we saw and the powerful message we heard. You know, um, sexual abuse and exploitation of children is um, a violation of human rights and uh, a public health problem with um, you know, significant consequences for global health and development. So seeing young people and adults working together to address this situation is, um, is so fantastic. So I'm going to ask um, some questions to Carl and, um, and Ketra. Good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to introduce myself. Um, I'm Kat or Katra. Oh, uh, yes, is a member of the Adolescent Score Group of the Partic Participatory Barrier Analysis in the Philippines. Um, I am currently in first year college taking a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. And also, I'm passionate about helping adolescents and young people to speak up for themselves and to be the voice of those who can. And Kuya Carl? Hello. Hello, good afternoon once again and good morning to everyone. Um, I am Carl Wenwig Falka Santos Bagood, and I am also one of the core group member of Participatory Barrier Analysis Project from the Philippines. And today we will present to you um, our project. So Karen and Katra, thanks again so much for being with us. Uh, Carl, my first question really is, what are the reflections of different stakeholders in this project? I think it sounds amazing, this project, and thanks so much for the video. So, you know, I think we heard yes. that there were community leaders, service providers, teachers, youth involved. So what have been the main reflections from all these different stakeholders to what you guys are doing? 
Yes. Um, thank you so much, Ma'am. Good afternoon once again to everyone. So for the first question, um, what were the reflection of stakeholders coming from local government officials, service providers, and also from teachers? So for local government officials, they were amazed because the project was led by the adolescents and for adolescents itself. They have never encountered this kind of um, project where members of the target sector led the project themselves. Second, the reflections coming from service provider, they were also amazed because um, we as adolescents or core group rose to the challenge in a time of pandemic when there are issues and cases of sexual and gender-based violence. They said that um, it is rare for adolescents and young people like us to participate and lead this kind of initiative instead of being um, concerned only with our personal lives. And lastly, um, the reflections coming from the teachers, they were surprised that at such a young age, we were able to lead this kind of project. Of course, to address the issue of sexual violence against adolescents, and looking at us, they were happy and uh, they were happy and thankful of what we have become because some of them were our teachers before. So that's all. That's amazing. Wow, that they were your teachers before. Incredible. And actually, to be honest, from Colombia, I, I think this project is incredible. And there's so much I think we could do as young people here. So it'd be great at some point to connect again with you guys. Catherine and Carl, I guess my next question really is listening to what we saw in the video and what Carl's just mentioned with different stakeholders. What are the next steps for you guys in terms of the project? Where do you guys want to go with it? Um, thank you so much. So the question is, what were the next steps? So the next step that we planned with our core group is um, based on the findings, change activities or interventions were identified and prioritized the interventions prior prioritized by the adolescents and key st stakeholders. We're also use of social media to increase information dissemination and access to services and also to conduct of advocacy activities to improve family support and address prevalent issues and to also conduct of refresher course and trainings for stakeholders and services providers and the formation of multi-stakeholder case conference to address issues on a referral mechanisms and structural support along with child sensitive management and and also we have a next step is together with stakeholders um, and services providers, we adolescent core group formulated a strategic plan as well as work a financial plan that specified the activities to be conducted and resources that would be needed to implement the prioritized interventions. And the next steps, Kuya Carl will yes. introduce. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, Kat. And of course, to add on what Katra said, on what's um, after the, the project. So we also have the implementation of change activities focused on 23 barangays coming from local government units located within the 7-kilometer radius of the city center as our pilot areas. So in just two months, um, this are the following um, were, was able to accomplish, were able to accomplish. So first, the use of social media to increase information dissemination and access to services. So using Facebook, as we all know, Facebook was chosen by the core group um, as a social media platform to increase information on sexual violence and access to services because of its popularity among adolescents here in Zamboanga City. The Facebook page, I report Kabataan ZC, so you can um, search on it, I report Kabataan CC, was launched in September 2021. And currently, the page um, have been, uh, have more than 800 followers. According to Facebook page analytics, um, there are, uh, the posts reach around 145,800 people and there were around 13,900 post engagements. According also to audience analytic revealed, um, that the most engaging posts were those featuring and reporting and referral pathways for cases of child abuse and exploitation. Aside from that, in just two months, we were also um, we also conducted uh, the advocacy activities to improve family support and address prevalent social issues. Advocacy um, advocacy activities included the production of distribution of information, education, and, commun and communication, or what we call the IEC materials. And of course, the conduct of session on adolescent, sexual, and reproductive health, and on SOGI as well, or sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression, with the barangay local government units, including the local youth council officials. Also, the school were also included in the distribution of IEC materials. Also, and lastly, 
In just two months, we also conduct a refresher course and training for stakeholders and services providers. Um, and of course, the formation of multi-stakeholder case conference to address issues on referral mechanism and structural support along with child-sensitive case management. Here, the refresher course and training on referral mechanism and child-sensitive case management were conducted um, for service provider who directly attend to and to and, and, and to manage the cases of sexual abuse and violence. And local government and youth council officials. So the multidisciplinary case conference groups um, were refresher course and training. The composition of each group includes social workers, police officers, doctors, and representative of the village council for the protection of children. So the formation of the, of the multidisciplinary case conference groups ensured that the cases will be managed in a timely and effective manner, um, thereby improving access and quality of services um, for adolescent survivors of sexual violence. Okay, that's that's really amazing. And uh, like the the next question goes to Kit and Carl. So, what did um, participating in the project mean to you? Over to you, Kit. Um. Okay. Um. The question is, what did participating in the project mean to you? Well, for me, yeah. is in a way of I was able to understand and appreciate the issue and needs of adolescents affected by the circumstances that they face in their daily lives. Furthermore, as adolescents, um, I felt the trauma of some adolescent survivor survivors of sexual violence and their need to be heard and and also to break free from the experience. And this project means a lot to adolescents um, in helping them deal with their pain and also to recover to that trauma. That's all. Thank uh, you. Aside from that, after uh, aside from that, it is also to take care of our mental health. We went through counseling and debriefing after we conducted the focus group discussions with adolescents as our respondents. And we were able to process and manage our feelings about the story of our fellow adolescents. That's all, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, too. Um, okay, so the next question goes to you, Carl. Um, um, what were the challenges? Thank you. Um, so far, the challenges that we faced during the implementation of our project, the primary challenge was faced during the project um, was the pandemic. Since the city of Samboanga, our city was under lockdown several times, and we had limited the face-to-face -face interaction with the uh, with the with the adolescents. But we were a but we were also able to use online platforms such as the Google Meet. That's all. Okay, so um, this is the last question that still goes to you, um, Kate and Carl. So, like, what happened after the project? Um, like, how? Uh, what are the how to take it forward? Like, yes. Um, what happened after the project? So, first, we were able to launch the I report. It is a Facebook page that helps our fellow adolescents to reach out if they have uh, if they experience sexual violence. So the page is active even though the project has ended. So if there are cases reported via our Facebook page, we refer it to CFSI or Community and Family Services to assist us on how to respond. And the Facebook page is currently being managed by CFSI social worker at the Sambuanga sub office. Aside from that, I was also invited by, by my school and other different organizations to talk about what is our project and to showcase the result. It opens a lot of opportunity for me as well to my fellow core group member. Kat? Okay, also, um, after that, um, we still continue to advocate for access to services by survivors of sexual violence. And we want the voice of adolescents and young people to be heard so that no one is left behind. Thank you, and that's all. Okay, so um, I really mark my words. You guys are really amazing young people and I was really blown away by um, all what you guys said. So I really encourage you to go further with what you are doing. So now I'm going to give the floor to Ami to introduce the, the breakout groups. Thanks so much, Davina. And I completely echo what Davina has said. Carl, Kat, this is a, such an incredible project and so amazing to see something led by adolescents. I really wish you all the best in the next parts of these projects. Super interesting. And I'm sure everyone here wants to see how, how you guys move on forward in the future. As Davina said, we're now going to break out into two breakout rooms. 
So group one is a breakout room with myself, with Fernanda and Roberta. We're going to, we're going to focus on a, a case study that's kind of focused on the research that Fernanda was mentioning. And the second breakout room is with Joyce, Astrid, Davina, Carl and Kat. And this is going to be focused um, more on a case study linked to the work that Kat and Carl are doing. So my invitation to you is I understand that you can choose which breakout room you would like to go in. We're slightly short of time, so we may reduce slightly the timings for our breakout rooms. Yes, thanks so much, everyone. And unfortunately, I believe that we, we pushed for time. So we're going to now join back to the main room. Thank you to everyone who shared their comments, to Doreen, to Jules, really appreciate it. Uh, the Jamboard is still there, so feel free, maybe in another time, to continue following it. And um, we know that it's still it's an editable version. So I'm just going to wait until we have everyone back with us and we will continue into the next part of our session. Thank everyone you so much. is back, Amy. Uh, <laughs> you can carry right on. Julie, excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> right. Well, welcome back. I. I hope that group two had a, a great discussion. I know that in group one, it was really interesting to hear some of the thoughts and reflections of coming out from colleagues and really thanks again to participating. I understand now we're just gonna pass to a quick Menti poll. Um, I think we have a link for group one and for group two, if I'm correct. Uh, so production team, I don't know if you would be able to help us kindly share those links. Uh, for those who took part in group one and for those who took part in group two. It's a quick menti poll uh, and then we will pass to the next sex section. Ah, perfect. Thank you so much, Natalie. So I understand colleagues uh, in the chat, we have the menti poll for group one. We would invite you to please click the link uh, and answer this, the following questions. And then for group two, which was child participation, we also have another link in the chat. Uh, again, we'd invite you to open the link and share your comments. So I'm just going to give you a qu one quick minute to fill that in, and then we'll pass to our next section. Thank you so much. Perfect. So group one, what is your one key takeaway from that negotiations at breakout session? Uh, we kindly encourage you to share your comments and your thoughts. And then we'll pass quickly to the slide for group two as well to see some of the feedback that was coming out of group two. So we've got here process, education dialogues are a priority, children need to be involved. Exactly, I think child-centered responses are super important. Context, I think Doreen you know, shared some of the context that she's working in. Really important that we think about different context. Negotiation preparedness, attacks on schools, um, importance of understanding protection risks, involving community leaders, uh, how to engage non-state armed actors in tangible manners, roles of communities to protect themselves. Really great back, uh, feedback here, colleagues. So thanks sir, for sharing. Judy, I don't know if we can pass now to group two on the screen, just to yeah. see some of the feedback from group two. Thanks so much. Apologies if you're group. seeing anything from that. <laughs> no, we're seeing group two, don't Great. worry. So group two, your key takeaway sessions from the child participation breakout session. We've got prioritizing education. Youth and children are capable of voicing their needs, very much in agreement. Uh, social cultural barriers and policy procedures. Collaboration to become inclusive. Child participation is key. Sharing ideas and experiencing. Supporting child and adolescent participants requires a multidisciplinary approach, very much in agreement. Um, we also have putting uh, children, adolescents needs at the center. Uh, new ideas, I think that's very true. It's important that we always innovate, no? that we have refreshing approaches to, to how we work uh, in our field. Youth and disabled people face various obstacles to participation agree. I think it's really important that we think of our inclusion and how we're including everyone regardless of their identity. Colleagues, thanks so much. I think there's so much here that we will look at and review. So I really thank you for taking part in those mentee polls. Um, slightly conscious of time because we will need to now move on to our closing. So I just want to pass over now to Barbara Wyerman. Uh, Barbara, welcome again to the space. Barbara is the advisor, the gender advisor in humanitarian action 
and also for gender-based violence, a focal point for um, protection, exploitation, and prevention of these um, pro protect uh, the prevention of sexual exploitation for the Swiss Development Corporation. So, Barbara, once again, welcome to the space. Just want to hand over to you to say a few words. Thank you very much, Amy, and good morning or good afternoon to all of you. I, I'm very uh, happy to have participated in this event. Thank you so much to all of you, to all the panelists and participants for the inspiring and truly amazing work you shared with us. You have shown us how things change when we put young people in the lead. It is really impressive how you are able to, how these young people are able to analyze the barriers that they face and how they negotiate, um, you know, how to solve the problem. It is really, for me, it was, it's again and again um, uh, amazing to see how convincing and creative young people are in the endeavor to bring about change. When I hear about this experience, I'm wondering why this is not done more often. Why organizations have difficulties to truly and not tokenly engage with the children and youth for whom they work. It is the same question that we must answer related to why it is so difficult to put women-led organizations and youth-led organizations in charge of addressing the problems that their members face. It seems obvious and yet as donors we are struggling to do the right thing. Switzerland has made a commitment to work towards equal partnership with local organizations, especially women-led organizations, through the call to action on the protection from GBV in emergencies. Equal partnerships with local organizations is also a top priority of the Swiss co-chairship of the pooled funds working group. I think equal partnership is the key word for effective action. It means listen and learn together and adjust the ways we work. At SDC, we are really pleased that we were able to fund the barrier analysis in the Philippines that was presented by Carl and Katra. We are sharing this excellent experience with our country offices and encourage them to take it up in their contexts. As it was mentioned just now in the feedback, child participation is key. I would like to thank the organizers of today's event for providing a platform to promote and support the innovative work of local organizations and for partnering with the initiatives of amazing young women and men. Thank you and back to you, Amy. Thanks so much, Barbara, and really echo your thoughts. No, so important that we have a very meaningful child and adolescent led participation and so great to hear from the project in the Philippines with Carl and Kata and great that we have this platform. So thanks so much for taking part, Barbara. Really appreciate it and all the efforts from your side. So I'm now just going to hand over to Amanda Whaler from uh, CEDA. She is a senior policy uh, specialist at the humanitarian unit. So Amanda, over to you to share a few words. Thanks so much. Um, thanks very much, Amy. And thanks in particular to uh, Carl and Kat and Davina um, for the energy and the drive that you've uh, displayed here today um, and the type of work that you're doing in your, uh, in your communities and countries. Um, Sometimes I feel that uh, those of you us who are a little bit older than you should just get out of the way and let you get on with your work and support you as much as we can. Um, from CEDA, um, part of our humanitarian strategy is uh, to provide dignified, help partners find dignified solutions to the protection and assistance needs that they have. Um, to work in hard to reach areas and to mainstream protection as a, as a kind of key concept in everything that we do. And the projects we've heard about today really encapsulate uh, those goals. And the, I think um, just to tie this to the overall topic of this year's forum, I think um, um, the idea of access that protects um, really challenges us to think about the quality of the work that we do. Um, and for uh, from my perspective and and you know what i hear in these projects is that that quality is about um the, having sustained access and reach um to people affected by crisis um to ensuring that people are able to participate in shaping the solutions uh, to their problems and in particular 
um, kids, adolescents, young people, um, women, um, to find and use and amplify um, local solutions wherever they happen, wherever, wherever they're present, and to hold aid organizations and including us as donors to account. And so my final words would just be a call to um, the community organizations and local organizations and the uh, youth activists that are listening to this uh, meeting and participating today um, is that we are committed to taking your feedback seriously. We are open to being held to account for the role that we play in the humanitarian architecture. And we are interested in hearing from you what makes a difference in the work that you do and to do what we can to provide that. So thanks very much to everybody and to the organizers for a very interesting event. No, thanks so much to you, Amanda, and, and for those closing remarks and words. Um, well, colleagues, we've arrived at the end of this event. Many thanks for all your time, for your attention and for your contributions. Uh, first and foremost, a great thanks to Carl and Katia for your presentation. I think I echo what Amanda and Barbara are saying. I think this has been a real learning lesson for all of us in the humanitarian sector of the importance of child and adolescent led um, projects. And I think, as Amanda said, no, it's really us that needs to step aside and, and to listen and understand how we can support and facilitate all the visions that you have. Uh, thank you to uh, Fernanda, to Roberta also to sharing some of the context in Mali. I think we really started to understand from that space, you know, the importance of context analysis, really understanding our context, engaging with a range of stakeholders and thinking about the different risks and power dynamics and relationships for each of those uh, stakeholders. So thanks so much for sharing that, Roberta. And finally, I wanted to give a great thanks to our co-facilitator, Davina. I know, Davina, that the connection hasn't been the best, but I think it's so great to have you here. And it was in super interesting to hear around all the work that you're doing with your organisation at the beginning of the presentation. So that's all from me, colleagues. I just want to pass over now to Davina for closing words. So, Davina, over to you. OK, so um, I'm, I'm really, really sorry for that. Um... It's really frustrating that uh, the connection was really un unstable. So I won't be able to on my camera. So um, as uh, my colleague said, um, we are at the end of the session. So um, thank you for thank you to the participants for your contributions, to everyone involved in the forum and the setting up of, of this event. So there is one thing I want to say before I leave. Remember that if you stand for a reason, be prepared to stand alone like a tree. And if you fall on the ground, fall like a seed that grows back to fight again. Thank you, everyone. May God bless you.